Okay, welcome to lecture 9.1. We're going to talk about forces, moments, torques, and uh, get the third piece of the equations of motion so that we have kinematics. Um, and then we've talked about inertia, mass distribution, mass, etc. And then this is the third piece that we need to um, develop the equations of motion. So we're going to talk about uh, how forces act on a multi body system. Okay, so starting uh, with the main title here, forces, moments, and torques. <clears throat> so the key thing is that uh, forces are these abstractions that we use to describe how uh, or, or what makes something move. So forces cause particles and rigid bodies to move. Right? And that means more explicit, explicitly to accelerate Excel rate or angular accelerate. If I can spell it right, Excel rate. Okay, so we can be at rest, accelerate to some moving state, or be at a uh, a moving state with constant velocities and accelerate to another moving state. Uh, right. Um, we're going to use vectors again to um, describe forces. So uh, forces uh, will have a direction and a magnitude. So we use vectors. All right. Um, the vectors we've been using so far uh, generally do not have a location in 3D space. So vectors in general But there are certain type of vectors called bound vectors that do. So they have a uh, direction, magnitude, and location. If we call a vector bound, It is associated with the so called line of action. If it's not, associated with the line of action. The vector is called free. Okay. So if we um, think about a little system here, got a reference frame, and then I have some rigid body, for example, and I'm going to have a point P, then um, if I have a vector here in blue representing a force that's pushing on point P of this rigid body, 
then um, it acts back to black. It acts on this line of action, which I'm making a dotted line. We could call this line L, for example, as the line of action L. Uh, the point P exists on the line of action L, and the line of action L has the same direction as F. So in this case, um, the force F is a bound vector. Line of action L um, always contains point P. F is parallel to L and uh, thus is associated with that point P in the line of action L. F is bound to line of action L. And L contains P. Similarly, we can think about uh, a rigid body. Mm -hmm. Let's just say it's moving in reference frame A, call this body B, and we've already learned about an angular velocity vector, omega of B and A, but it doesn't matter where I draw that vector, right? It um, is not associated with a line of action or any point. Um, it is a free vector in that case. Um, so it has the same meaning no matter the location we draw it in. Right? So basic concepts there, bound and free vector, uh, and we're going to use bound vectors with forces to develop more here. So let's go to a new page. Um, the next thing is, uh, let's, let's define a moment. So you can calculate a moment of any of a bound vector with respect to a point. Okay, so for example, I'm going to have a line of action L here. And uh, some vector V that is bound to L. Right. And then uh, if I define a point P somewhere else here in space, I can calculate the moment of V with respect to P. And how we do that is um, if I pick any point on this line L, and I draw a position vector to it, so let's say this point, oops, call this P, I'm going to call it P1, and then this is the position vector from P to P1. Then the moment of this bound vector B with respect to point P is going to be a vector, and um, It is defined as 
uh, the vector from P to P1 on line L crossed with that vector V. Okay. So it's cross product, we get a, uh, a moment with respect to P. Now, it doesn't matter which point I select here. P2, P3, or P4, I can select any point on that line. And this moment will be equal And even equal R P4 with respect to P cross with V. So as long, any point on the line, I get the same moment. And uh, um, that is our definition of a moment with respect to a point P. Okay? So we can calculate these moments of bound vectors. That bound vector doesn't necessarily have to be a force, but um, if it is, um, that's going to be our, our primary use case there. Uh, let me just remind you that PI is any point on line L. So that's the definition of a moment. If we have a set of bound vectors. I'm going to call that set S. Give it a name. And then these vectors will be VI for I equals one, two, um, new is the variable I use there. So we have a set of um, vectors here. Then we can define something called the resultant. The resultant of this set is R of the set S equals simply the sum of all of those vectors in the set. Also a definition. Okay, so we have now the resultant. Um, and actually I didn't mean bound here, so take that away. So if we have a set of S vectors, can be bound or free. I'll just write that, bound or free. Then we can calculate its resultant. If that set of vectors is bound, or each vector, um, we can calculate the moment of the set with respect to a point P. So the moment of some set of bound vectors S with respect to a point P is going to uh, then look like this. So we've got new vectors. We can take the um, uh, position vector from P to uh, I used 
just QI to give a different name there, crossed with VI. All right, so this is the position vector from the point P to any point QI associated with that bound vector VI. Right. You are points on the line of action of VI. Right. So we can take the moment of a whole set of bound vectors, the moment of a single vector, and we've got this idea of a resultant, which is just the sum of a set of vectors. Right. Okay, uh, one last useful uh, thing to uh, that you can do here with moments. Um, so if you know the point uh, or the moment about one point, we'll say the moment of some set of vectors S about point Q. Right? Um, you can find the moment about another point call it point P um, with this relationship so the moment of some bound set of vectors s with respect to point P is going to be the moment of the bound set of vectors S about Q, which we already know, plus um, some vector from P to Q, right? So the position vector from P to Q crossed with the resultant of the set of vectors bound to Q, to point a line of action that contains Q. All right, so this is uh, resultant of S bound to line of action containing Q. So you can calculate the moment about any other point if you know the moment about uh, one point and you know the distance between those two. And then you can use this resultant to find the moments about different points. Yeah. Right. So those are the main pieces about uh, moments. Um, the next thing I want to introduce um, is if the set S of bound vectors has a resultant that is zero S equals zero, uh, then the set S is called a couple. Okay. And simple examples of, of couples if you have uh, if you have two vectors equal magnitude in the opposite direction um, we have a couple and in fact uh, this has a special name it's called a simple couple so it's the smallest couple you can get two vectors equal magnitude opposite directions 
and uh, but couples can be anything right so I can have uh, a bunch of vectors and as long as they all add up and their uh, resultants are zero then that set of vectors are a couple okay so all of these are couples um, What makes that set of vectors a couple is that the resultant uh, is zero, okay? And then we um, can say that uh, the torque of a couple, oops, so the torque of a couple uh, is the moment of the couple about a point. And um, because the resultant is zero, the torque is the same around any point. So now we have the idea of uh, we've got forces, we've got resultants, we've got moments, we've got a couple, which is a set of vectors, and then the torque of a couple is the moment of that couple about any point, which happens to be the same because the resultant is zero. So these are the basic um, building blocks that we'll use for describing forces, moments, and torques that are acting on particles or a collection of particles or a rigid body. Um, one very useful thing is that uh, you can replace any set of bound vectors. with a torque of a couple and a resultant of that set bound to a point of your choosing. So if I have um, a bunch of vectors that I call a bound, uh, where each of them are bound, right? Um, and I call this S set of bound vectors. It turns out that um, you can represent that set if I pick a point we'll call it Q in this case I can represent it with a resultant of S Oops. a resultant of S bound at Q and uh, just pick another well, I'm just go with green and a torque and I'll I'll draw this torque just as a it's a vector um, but that vector I mean sorry this torque is going to be equal to the moment of that set of vectors about the point Q All right 
So any set of bound vectors we can uh, represent by a simple uh, torque of a couple that is calculated by taking the moment of that set with respect to some point Q, and then we take the resultant of that set and by, um, bind it or make it bound to Q or the line of action through Q. And I have an example in the uh, online notes where you can see how to do that calculation uh, for a car that has uh, different forces at its wheels. I'm not going to do that here. Um, it is uh, relatively straightforward to do this, and you should have seen this in your uh, introductory dynamic class um, that you've already taken. Um, but this last thing to say about this, this is the simplest um, replacement um, of S in the set of vec bound vectors. Right? This single couple and a single, sorry, single torque and a single bound vector at Q. All right, so these are the main pieces that we need for talking about forces, moments, and torques so that we can uh, make use of them as we move along. All right, so I want to say a few things about sign conventions and forces and torques. As this can be confusing. Um, let's say I have uh, two bodies here, this triangle and a rectangle that come into contact. And I'll call uh, triangle A and the rectangle B. And I'm going to say that this is a frictionless surface, so we only have a normal contact force that will occur between these two objects. Um, so they'll contact each other. Well, if we want to think about the force that are acting on A and B in this case, then we can draw a free body diagram of both A and B. Right? Uh, and this is also uh, learned in your prior dynamics classes. Um, I'm going to take A and B and copy them. And let's get rid of that. And then I'm going to separate them, right? So we're going to make free body diagrams of these two objects. So I cut them apart, and then I say, well, what are the forces that are acting uh, between them. So you might say, well, A is pushing on B, and B has to be pushing back on A, right? If we have uh, Newton's third law in mind there. And uh, you can then uh, draw two arrows, and then we'll call this the force on A and the force on B. Okay, so we've got now our free body diagrams. I uh, need to pick some direction here that we'll call a positive direction. So I'm going to say that this represents the unit vector AX in the A reference frame. And uh, pointing to the right is our, uh, our positive direction for if a vector is pointing in the direction of AX, then it's a, a positive value. And, and then the opposite, it would be a negative. OK, so um, we've got our free biodiagram. We've got a sign convention for our coordinate system, essentially, here with the AX. And um, What do we want to say about this? So I'll say um, if the force Fa on A is positive, right? We, if we had a positive numerical value here, it's like 5 newtons, then um, uh, 
then pushes, or you can imagine it pushing, pushing A to the left, right? And that is the negative AX direction. And similarly, if B, the force on B, is a positive value, then it pushes B to the right, the AX direction. Yeah? So why is that? Well, I drew FB arrow pointing to the right, and that means that if there's if FB has a positive magnitude, then it's going to be pushing to the right in the same. So my direction, I drew the arrowheads uh, define the sign convention here of each of these forces, right? But another valid sign convention. Um, see if I can take uh, I'll just grab well, grab I'll just grab it all let me copy that another valid sign convention is um, all right I could draw my arrows like this and all it does is switch the sign of both FA and FB. Um, similar, and then I could write this same statement here, and I would just swap uh, left and right in each of the sentences in the negative and positive direction. So this is uh, also a valid sign convention. But we can have even more sign conventions. So let me paste. Oops. Actually, um, These are also fine. Okay. I can draw these arrows in the same direction, and uh, that means positive values of FB push B to the left, positive values of FA push A to the left, and then the opposite here. Okay. Um, So uh, any of these are fine. You can choose any one you want. You can draw your green arrows in any direction to capture the sign convention in the picture. But when you write the math down and you interpret any kind of values um, that result from your calculations, uh, you need to look back at these figures and know which direction you drew the arrow so that you know which direction the forces are being applied. Right. So all of these are valid, but you got to pick one and you got to know what it is. You got to write it down so that the numbers and your calculations um, are useful. All right. So uh, this goes the same for torques and moments. So for example, for torques. Um, let me draw. We can draw a little uh, motor housing here that has a motor. I should make that bigger. Uh, 
let's say this is a motor housing and, a, and I've got a, a stator and a rotor here and then on the rotor um, we can have some kind of uh, I don't know, lever attached to that if I uh, make a free body diagram of this then I will take the stator out uh, I'm sorry the rotor out of the stator it leaves me with this hole uh, in the motor housing and then I've got the rotor with this lever attached to it uh, I separate those as free body diagrams the motor um, would create some kind of torque uh, between these two things so if uh, that is the case I can draw a torque and uh, we'll call this the torque on B we'll call this B and we call this A and um, if I know that there's equal and opposite torques acting here I can then draw well there must be a torque on the inside of this in the opposite direction and I can pick uh, this sign convention and call that torque on A right so this is fine I can make them point the other way and I can do the other two options so there's th four sign conventions I can make for uh, the torques in the same way that I did the force you got to pick one you got to know what it is you make your free body diagrams so, so that you can interpret things properly afterwards so I mentioned Newton's third law you need to keep this in mind too right? and this is the idea that there's always an equal and opposite force or torque right. so um, let's think about uh, that a bit uh, if I have my triangle and rectangle again and they're in contact and let's say that <clears throat> I uh, choose this sign convention FB and FA and we also still need Right, we've got some direction in our coordinate system that we call positive B A. So I have that scenario again. Then Newton's third law would tell us that F A plus F B equals to zero. Right? So that would ensure that we have uh, equal and opposite forces with the sign convention that I have chosen here. So if I choose another one, another sign convention, quite have room let's stick that there so with this sign convention um, and I'm gonna swap uh, FA so let's get rid of that and let's make FA and FB both point in the same direction in our drawing here then Um, for Newton's third law to hold FA minus FB must equal to zero right so the math right is going to change such that you make their Newton's third law hold depending on how you draw your sign convention for those forces and you have to keep that in mind when you are setting up the various equations and what forces are acting on each body etc Um, a useful example to think about this too is a 
let's think about two blocks that can slide frictionlessly uh, on the surface here. Call this block A, block B, and now I'm going to imagine a, a simple linear spring um, attached between block A and block B, and I'll give it a uh, linear spring stiffness K. Okay, now um, let's introduce a couple of dimensions or coordinates so um, we'll call the distance from the wall to uh, the end of the spring there on a q a and then q b to the other end of the spring. All right. So let's make a free body diagram of these two blocks. choose uh, a sign convention like so. For the forces. All right. This uh, sign convention, um, I'm going to say, call this uh, uh, positive intention. So if I uh, stretch the spring, right, I should get two positive F A and F B pulling, trying to pull the um, uh, A and B back together. So if I give a tension on the spring, both F A and F B are positive. So I say positive intention, All right? So we call that uh, positive intention and um, our Newton's third law, Fa plus Fb, has to equal zero, right? Um, if I write out the forces separately, um, Fa, right, the force on Fa, must be some change in the spring, right? Some delta Q, okay, times the spring stiffness. Okay, well, if, uh, if I make QA equal to zero and I um, increase and give a positive value of QB, then um, we know that would be QB times K. Okay. Uh, if I give a negative, uh, if I give a negative value of uh, QA, um, I would also get a tension force, right? So a positive value of QB will put it in tension or I'm making a negative direction of QA. So I can write that QB minus QA will give me the proper uh, tension force here. And uh, I didn't introduce AX, but this is AX. Okay, so I can write this tension force properly as, as so if uh, QA is zero, then um, positive values of QB will give me the positive tension force. If QB is zero, then um, a positive value of QA will um, give a negative um, uh, force there, opposite direction of AA. Right, so we have that. And then similarly, I can write FB 
to make sure it fits with my sign conventions. Um, and that's just going to be the negative of FA to match with our So that is true, right? And um, does that hold true? Where we can see that FA uh, equals um, QB minus QA, KAX, and then minus QB minus K minus QA, K. AX, which equals to zero. Sorry, this was supposed to be FA plus FB equals to zero. All right, so I've defined here the um, positive intention um, to match with uh, the Q values here if uh, we increase both. Um, if I give a positive QA, it's going to put the spring into compression, right? So that's why I have the signs as I do in these two expressions. Um, you can then think about also the right. If I were to draw in like, oops, if I were to draw it like this, then this would be positive in compression. Yep. All right, so that's a useful thing to think about in terms of the sign conventions there. Uh, all right, next topic, I want to talk about this an idea called contributing contributing and non-contributing. Forces. In the next lesson, 9.2, we'll, uh, you'll see more clearly what these are. Um, but let's say that I have two bars here. And I'm going to pin the two bars at a uh, pin joint here, we'll call this point P, um, and it's a uh, frictionless pin joint. Frictionless pin joint that I uh, pin the two bars together, we'll call this bar A, this bar B, right? And um, the angles uh, of each bar in space will say have um, some coordinate. So I'm going to define just a couple of vertical lines in our uh, overall coordinate space here. And then I'm going to say this is not a very good arc, but uh, this will be. Uh, theta 1 with theta a would be better, I guess. And then this one would be theta b. Okay, so we have a, a measure of the angle of each of the bars um, just from the vertical in space there. And then um, I'm going to say too that uh, we have some torque equal and opposite acting so I'll call this torque B and torque A right where torque A plus torque B equals zero 
right? So they're equal and opposite. If there was a motor or something at this frictionless pin joint that drove the two um, bars relative to each other, then they would produce uh, torques of this nature on each of the bars, right? Okay, so that's the basic uh, setup there that I want. Um, then if I draw my free body diagrams of these two bars, and I'll just copy those over, separate one bar, separate the other bar, right? And um, move this one here. So now we've separated the two bars at the pin joint, and um, we know that we have torque A and torque B being applied to each body. But then there's some um, contact force here at this uh, pin joint. So I'm going to do those in blue. Um, it's pointed at some arbitrary direction, and then um, they're going to be equal and opposite. So I'll try to get those right. And we call this force on A, force on B. And then I'm just going to call these two points P, B, right, and P, A. So P, B, and P, A, when they're connected, are R, P. This is the same point. Here we've separated into um, two free body diagrams, right? But FA and FB, they are equal and opposite, but also TA and TB. All right. So if this thing is uh, moving through space, translating and rotating with these angles, then you can imagine, hmm, let me get these two pieces, copy it. All right, so if this is moving, um, the point P here, uh, it's gonna be moving through some path in space, right? And I'm gonna call that path S there, that it happens to be moving through. Um, so we can actually write then the work done at point P. So if I think about the work done by force A, that would look something like the integral over this path S of the force on A dotted with, and I'll say a D, e, D uh, S, right? A um, infinitesimal little vector here that is always tangent to the path, right? So this is our D S. Okay, so as this thing moves through, we can dot the force in the direction of um, the path that it moves to get the uh, scalar value of work over whatever the, uh, the full path is. Okay? We can also do that same with B. All right, so the force due to B follows the same path, okay? But we know that um, FA plus FB equals to zero, right? And they both have the same path. Um, and so that would imply the WA um, equals minus WB, if I use this, plug it in. So the work, the total work, right, is WA plus WB, it's gonna be always equal to zero. So then these contact forces, they do no work, even though there is some path they're moving. Um, they're always going to cancel out each other because they're equal and opposite 
moving along the same path. Okay, so they do no work. FA and FB do no work on the system. So these are called are going to be uh, non-contributing forces. And I'm not quite fitting there. Non-contributing. Right? <clears throat> and let me move this over so you can read it. There we go. So non-contributing. Now, torque A and torque B are also equal and opposite, but theta A and theta B are not the same, right? So torque A and torque B, because theta B and theta A are the same, are not the same, uh, are going to be contributing forces. So let me just fit this here. Um, So TA and torque on B are contributing because they do work on the system. Right. Theta A Theta B are not the same, I'll call it path, even though they're angles, right? So when we form these similar integrals that are going to be some kind of uh, torque uh, through an angle, the uh, uh, values are not going to cancel out with each other. All right, so we have a contributing torque here and a non-contributing contact force and we'll expand on that more in the next lecture um, in terms of to see how how they interplay with the, the equations that we'll derive but uh, a couple things uh, to say further about it there are that um, there are going to be three types of non-contributing forces to be aware of. One are what we just saw, contact forces um, on particles Cross smooth frictionless surfaces. So, right, if I have some kind of object here in contact with the surface and it's frictionless. the normal contact force between there is going to be zero, the same way that we uh, saw, or, or be non-contributing. The work done by that is going to be zero. Um, another little example. If you think about a few dominoes that are set up, and then um, We've got a couple of dominoes and they're toppling over onto each other, like so. But we um, model this uh, contact as frictionless. Then um, at each one of these contact points, right? If they're frictionless, then um,
then these will not contribute and do no work also. Right. Second one type to uh, think about is uh, any internal um, contact and body distance forces. Between any two points, in a rigid body. All right. So um, you can think about having a rigid body, B, uh, in your mechanics courses you often uh, splice, slice uh, a rigid body, right? That wasn't very good. And two. And then you think about, well, what are the, uh, if I cut that uh, object, what are the internal forces there? So you would have some equal and opposite um, shear and normal forces you would probably call them and uh, and then some kind of moment if this is just a 2d um, right you've got M F uh, Y FX FX right so these kind of forces are these internal um, contact forces that if you were to imagine to split that and draw the free body diagrams for each, th those would not do any work on a system. Similarly, if you have uh, some wires that don't stretch, um, there's stiff, infinitely stiff wires there that connect several part particles, right? then all of the forces that you can imagine, these tension forces that are all there present among each of these wires to keep this thing in shape, all of those are these distance forces between those particles. Uh, and they're the same as you would see, right, if I have some rigid body and I pick two particles in that, um, the forces that ensure there's no change in distance between these two particles um, are distance forces. So none of these are going to do any work on the system. Right? And the last one to consider is really a special case of one Um, but it is if uh, you have rolling without slipping. Contact forces um, do not contribute or do no work. So in this case we have wheel rolling on a surface uh, with no slip and you know whatever the contact forces here are and it goes for all directions oops and all those forces acting there you can uh, neglect those if it's rolling without slip All right, so those are the three cases of non-contributing forces, and we're going to see how they play a role in the uh, 
in the functions and such uh, in the next lesson. So we'll close, leave it with that. And then I want to say one last thing here is that um, in the online notes, I show you some symbolic definitions of forces. So symbolic definitions. And I'll just say of contributing forces are possible. Um, but uh, these may not always result in favorable. Um, numerical evaluation. Um, and we'll see that when we start to simulate systems and work with the numerical properties. We're still all in symbolics, but soon we're going to be um, evaluating these equations and seeing and seeing them from a numerical perspective um, but uh, I'm not going to go over the forces that I uh, put there but see um, the online notes and also um, Kane's book um, for um, some ideas on implementing forces. You can also always treat these uh, contributing forces as um, um, unknown, right? And you can work out the numerical evaluation of those separately, and we'll see how to do that too. But that is uh, it for this lesson. It gives you a basic idea of working with forces, moments, and torques. And uh, we'll use uh, these properties um, in the next lesson.